We're broadcasting today from Stanford University in California. California, a state that's now in its fourth straight year of drought. This week, new mandatory water restrictions went into effect, with residents required to cut back water use by a net total of 25 percent. Just Thursday, the U.S. Drought Monitor said a wet May that led to greener pastures in some areas failed to bring any relief and, quote, the sprouting of grasses will most likely provide extra fuel for early fall wildfires once the vegetation dies off this summer. Meanwhile, a new study by the University of California, Davis, finds that in 2015 alone, the drought will cost the state's farmers and agricultural industry owe $2.7 billion and more than 18,000 jobs. The study noted, quote, the socioeconomic impacts of an extended drought in 2016 and beyond could be much more severe. All this comes as the death toll from an ongoing heat wave in India has topped 2,300, making it the fifth deadliest in recorded history. India's Earth Sciences Minister, Harsh Vardhan, said it's not just an unusually hot summer, it is climate change. Well, for more, we're joined by two guests. Noah Diffenbach is a senior fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment and an associate professor here at Stanford University in environmental earth system science. He recently published a study that found a link between global warming and California's historic drought. Also joining us is Mark Jacobson, professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford and the director of its atmosphere energy program. Uh, Mark Jacobson also is the founder, co-founder of the Solutions Project, which combines science, business and culture to develop and implement science-based clean energy plans for states and countries. And we're going to talk about what those plans are for all 50 states. But first, uh, to Noah Diffenbach, the connection between the drought and climate change. Uh, so we know that uh Climate uh, change can influence drought in a number of ways, and uh, you know drought is important to keep in mind is really the effect of a moisture that's available. So, a lot of people when they think of drought, they think of how much is it raining, but really it's it's the effect of moisture and heat in the atmosphere can really affect that moisture. How much moisture is available for crops? How much moisture is available in reservoirs? How much moisture is available in snowpack? And it does so in a few ways. Uh, it uh, draws water out of soils, right? So it, it, the hotter it is, the more evaporation there will be, the more transpiration from plants. That's uh, so what we're seeing with the U.S. Drought Monitor is really the long-term effects over this drought of high temperatures. Uh, it also affects snow. And in California, about a third of our uh, water storage is reliant on snowpack as a natural reservoir. We don't have the, the concrete reservoirs to store enough water that, that California needs. We rely on that snowpack. And the hotter it is, the more precipitation falls as rain rather than snow. And the snow that does fall melts earlier in the year. Uh, and we're seeing those uh, in California in this drought. And when we look over the long-term history of California, we're seeing increasing occurrence of uh, years in which there's both low rainfall and high temperature. And that's when we know we have a elevated risk of drought. Have you ever seen anything like this before? Well, I was born in 1974, so I was alive in the much-remembered 1976-1977 uh, drought. Uh, you know, something that's interesting is that, one, uh, a lot of our climate indicators uh, show that, that this drought is more severe than, than any drought that's happened in California's recorded history, 120 years of recorded history. This is the most severe drought. And secondly, you know, a lot of people talk about population growth and development in California, and uh, these have been uh, really, uh, really large over, over the last 30 or 40 years. But interestingly, statewide, our water use is pretty similar now compared to uh, in 1976-77. In so we've actually become much more efficient at using water in California. And so we have a much larger population, but our total water use is, is pretty similar. Uh, so it really is that, you know, this is a more severe drought from a climate perspective. Um, Mark Jacobson, can you talk about the drought in California and this record number of deaths in India, 2,300 people uh, in the latest heat wave? Well, there are a lot of impacts of, of climate change, or what we also call global warming. And global warming is really the increase in average temperatures over the whole globe. 
And in some places you get lower temperatures on average, but in more places you'll get higher temperatures. You'll get more extreme events, um, mostly because the, uh, the average temperature is higher. The extremes are mostly in the warming direction. So you're going to get uh, some places where you'll have much higher temperatures than uh, you'll normally get. And in some of these places you'll have greater heat waves and more deaths as a result. And, or you'll have more drought as well. And, you know, in some places you do get cool temperatures. And so, you know, as some people who don't believe in global warming or climate change will say, oh, why is it cold outside if there's global warming occurring? And that is because it's, you're looking at the average over the globe when you're talking about uh, global warming. And so you do get both lower temperatures and higher temperatures, but you'll get more cases of higher temperatures. And these higher temperatures will in result in greater um, heat stress on people, and that will, is one source of mortality. Another source of mortality uh, is enhanced air pollution. Higher temperatures, on average, increase air pollution, but particularly where the air pollution is already bad, and that's another source of mortality. Another source of mortality is greater extreme uh, storminess. Uh, you'll get greater ex uh, extremes in uh, severe weather, such as uh, more intense hurricanes, for example. And because you just, like, hurricanes are driven by warmer sea surface temperatures, and the ocean temperatures are warmer, on average, over the globe. And so you'll get greater intensity of, of the hurricanes, although not necessarily greater number. So what do you say, um, either of you, to Senator Inhofe, who takes a snowball and brings it onto the floor of the Senate and says, you call this global warming? Well, I think this is really a question about risk. And, and no. uh, you know, we're seeing that in California. Um, and so one example is our is our drought here. And when we look back at the 120 years of, of observed record in California, what we see is temperature goes up, temperature goes down, precipitation goes up, precipitation goes down, drought indicators go up, they go down. Uh, but what we see very clearly is that uh, there's a much higher risk of drought when temperatures are high. So it takes low precipitation, but if that low precipitation coincides with warm temperatures, uh, the risk that the, that low precipitation produces drought is about twice as high compared to uh, cooler temperatures. And what we've seen is uh, California's gotten warmer and warmer and warmer. We've gone from a regime in which about half the years were warm and half the years were cool and half the years were wet and half the years were dry to over the last two decades, 80 percent of the years have been warm. And what that means is we've seen twice as many drought years. We've seen uh, double the percentage of low precipitation years that end up producing drought. So that's that's really risk. It's really about the probabilities. Uh, and, and when we talk about the fingerprints of climate change, the fingerprints of climate change on extreme events, we're really talking about risk. What's the probability that these extreme events occur? And do you see this as a one-off event in California, the drought, if it can be dealt with now? Well, our, our research shows very clearly that the conditions that are producing this drought are becoming much more probable. We see that in the historical record. Uh, the conditions are, are becoming more likely in the historical record. Uh, we also see it when we look at climate model experiments. Uh, we can talk about climate model experiments if, if you want. We'd, you know, we'd love to put the Earth in a lab and run all kinds of experiments on it, like, like you can do in a Petri dish. We're not able to do that. We use climate models to run those experiments. But we see very clearly that we're already on the cusp of really experiencing this, the, these kinds of conditions much more frequently. And in fact, even uh, that United Nations target of two degrees Celsius that uh, you know, we've heard, heard discussed uh, in Copenhagen and since and, and in the run up to, to Paris this, this fall, uh, even at that two degree level of global warming, California is likely to be in a regime where year after year we're experiencing very warm or severely hot conditions. What that means is that we have a much higher risk that when there's low precipitation, that it's also going to be hot. And that's exactly what we're experiencing in this drought. And talk about uh, Mark Jacobson in India when we talk about hot. What are the temperatures we're talking about? Well, in, we look at it in terms of well, degrees Celsius most of the world uses, but in Fahrenheit, um, uh, the temperatures can get uh, up to an, an extreme heat, you're getting up to you know over 100 degrees in Fahrenheit uh, for quite uh, severe for a significant period of time, and so it's sustained over a period of time. That's the problem because if you just have a short you know one day of hot weather, it's not going to cause a problem. But uh, many days in a row can really increase mortality. And 
people most affected are those already weak, uh, the elderly and those who are sick or otherwise are weak or have illness. Um, so the temperatures, though, are have been sustained over periods of time, and so this is the this is the main problem with um, that you'll find what in any place where you're impacted. In other places that are impacted would be like sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where you'll have extreme heat events, uh, where people are already on the verge of you know uh, severe weather, and then you, you just increase the temperature just a little bit, and that causes a huge mortality as a result. Um, a lot of politicians who are climate deniers say this has been going on for a very long time. Um, Professor Diffenbaugh, in 2013, uh, you published a report that found climate change is on pace to occur 10 times faster uh, than any change recorded in, what, 65 million years? Well, so in that paper, we were, we were looking at global-scale temperature change. Uh, so we were looking at global warming, and the rate of global warming, if we look at the 2 degrees C target that the United Nations is putting forward, if we look at 4 degrees C, which is really where we're likely to end up if we continue along the emissions trajectory that we've been on as a globe. Uh, so 4 degrees in 100 years, we can look back at the, at the historical record. When geologists look back at, at, the, at the sediments in the ocean and, and the rock record on land, look at fossils. Uh, what they find is that there certainly have been periods where there's been 4 degrees of warming or, or 10 degrees of cooling, but these have happened over very long periods. So uh, the, the most rapid warming that's been seen since the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago uh, was a period called uh, the Eocene. It happened in the, in the Eocene. It was about 55 million years ago, a long time ago. And there was 4 or 5 degrees of warming, but it looks like it happened in about 10,000 years. So we're talking about doing in a century what Earth has done in thousands of years. And that's really the big difference for the, for the global scale. We do know, looking back at that period in the Eocene, that it was a very different climate. Uh, there were alligators and palm trees inside the Arctic Circle. Right? So the, the palm trees kept up because they had 10,000 years to do it. The alligators kept up. They had 10,000 years to do it. But we're talking about an ice-free Arctic with, with temperatures that look a lot like coastal Florida. So, wait, wait, say that again? Well, so in that period, when the last time that we, that we saw this four degrees of warming, uh, it, it happened over, over t you know, thousands of years, uh, and it created a very different climate. So uh, if we look at the Arctic Ocean, we know that it was at least seasonally ice-free, uh, so no summer ice in the Arctic. And when geologists reconstruct those temperatures using the chemistry and the, looking at the fossils, uh, that were uh, of, of the plants that were there, they, they see that it looks a lot like coastal Florida does now. Hmm. So people who say Earth has been through this before, they're right in terms of the magnitude of change. Uh, but the big difference is how rapid that change was. And we know from looking at those periods in the past that the climate was really, really different. Uh, so we're not saying that, that uh, Earth hasn't experienced climate change before. What we're saying is that we have very strong evidence that what we're seeing now is due primarily to human activities, and that the pace of change is much more rapid than what uh, ecosystems have been exposed to in the recent geologic past. We're going to break, and when we come back, we want to talk about solutions, what is possible.